as you know, the gentlemen, uh, I will introduce them briefly, uh, but have always, have all been involved in one way or the other, uh, working on IP, protecting intellectual property rights, um, discussing why it is important, but always from different angles and from different backgrounds. And I think, uh, for me, it's a privilege to, uh, to chair such a distinguished panel. And I would simply ask uh, Andrew Kowalsin, uh, who is uh, with uh, Kowalsin uh, uh, Advocacy, uh, to, to start out. Andrew's background, if I may, is um, having worked also for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on the IP um, issues, um, has a broad uh, spectrum since he is working with many think tanks across the world and uh, is always pushing the, the issue, um, bringing in the perspective of industry, which is very helpful for think tanks and for academics as well, because of course we have a different angle, we have a different approach. So Andrew, you are the first one, would you please get started? Great, thank you very much Barbara, and thank you for the opportunity to be here at the European Resource Bank. As Barbara mentioned, um, I've been involved with the ERB for a few years, but also work uh, domestically with think tanks and advocacy organizations as well. So talking about intellectual property, um, you know, companies and industry alike are, are always looking for ever more competitive ways to succeed by developing and incorporating creative and useful innovations into products and services that we all benefit from and all enjoy in virtually every area of life. But let's talk about the benefits of IP and IP protection. So the benefits of IP. IP has played a vital role in the growing economies of develop and developing countries all over the world in spurring innovation in helping entrepreneurs and businesses monetize their innovation, in supporting jobs and benefiting the economy, in benefiting consumers and society through a continuous stream of innovative, competitive products and services, as well as providing safety and security through trademarks, which create brand integrity. But when we talk about IP, we talk about these, these intangibles. But advanced societies have long understood that by protecting the proprietary rights of artists, authors and entrepreneurs, innovators and inventors, that they were promoting and protecting the greater public welfare. And as the knowledge economy advances, more and more of the value of the overall economy will come from these high added values, the intangibles, meaning the IP, and innovations, brands, and works. In many companies, even now, over 80% or more of their market value is attributed to IP. The benefits of intellectual property aren't limited to large companies, for example, SMEs, small medium enterprises, in the tech sector in Europe reported at least 10% growth when they invested in the promotion and protection of IP rights. As we think about intellectual property, we need to really think about the fundamentals. And many in this room are familiar with this from a recent letter, I guess two years ago now, that we, that we, uh, we all signed. So if you think about it, there's a few fundamentals. The rule of law, property, and a transparent political environment are the foundation of a fair and prosperous societies. Without the existence of rule of law, transparency, and an independent judiciary, it is not possible to administer a just society. Without the proper infrastructure to ensure democratic governance, property, including IP, cannot be secured. As a result, individuals are less likely to create and develop IP due to the uncertainty and the validity of the rights attached. As a result, economic and political instability can develop which diminishes the, co the confidence in the government. Second, IP rights are affirmed in international treaties as human rights. This is something that Chris Butler mentioned uh, the other day. Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any specific, literary, or artistic production in which he is the author. Third, IP rights promote free speech and expression. Strong IP rights go hand in hand with free speech as creators vigorously defend their ability to create works of their choosing, free from censorship. IP rights promote free expression by the government and incentivize creative and innovators to create and distribute knowledge, inventions, and creative works. We foster access to the knowledge and culture for all. Next, IP rights are integral to consumer protection and global security. IP rights protect consumers by enabling them to make educated choices about the safety, 
reliability and effectiveness of their purchases. We'll talk more about that later. The protection of IP rights is also vital to global security by preventing counterfeit parts, which compromise the reliability of the equipment and the safety of military personnel from entering the defense supply chains. Next, strong IP rights and contractual freedoms promote free and competitive markets. Without property rights, there can be no free markets, as it is clear rules of ownership that enable parties to exercise their right to contract. Once IP rights are secured, innovators and creators have the flexibility to enter in a wide range of contractual relationships with consumers, capitalizing on and responding to changes in technology and consumer demand. IP rights support free and competitive markets by leaving decisions to willing buyers and sellers. Decisions regarding what gets made and purchased are left to the market, rather than allowing the government to put a thumb on the scale and pick the winners and losers. Clearly defined property rights allow innovators and creators to devise business models that best serve consumers, foster competition, and benefit the economy as a whole. We know that IP rights are vital to economic competitiveness. WIPO has found that both in the U.S. and the EU, IP-intensive industries support tens of millions of jobs, contribute trillions of dollars to annual GDP. For example, in the EU, IP jobs contribute 26% of employment and 39% of GDP. Countries that, don't have, the countries that have strong IP protection have up to 13 times higher GDP than those do not. We know that IP rights must be res respected and protected online, on the internet. IP theft online is a persistent and growing problem. Protecting IP and internet freedom are both critically important and complementary. They are not mutually exclusive. A truly free internet, like any truly free community, is one where people can engage in legitimate activities safely and where bad actors are held accountable. Now those are some of the fundamentals of IP. But what about some of the threats? Specifically with counterfeiting, I'll talk about. So counterfeiting today represents a tremendous and ever-increasing global threat. Counterfeit products put the health and safety of consumers worldwide at risk while robbing governments, businesses, and communities of tax revenues, profits, and legitimate jobs. Counterfeit products from goods and merchandise, tobacco products and industrial parts to banknotes to medicines circulate across the globe. These products can cause real damage to consumers, industries, and economies. For example, counterfeit autom automotive parts are often of poor quality and lead to failure. Fake batteries and chargers may explode or catch fire. Counterfeit clothes or alcohol may contain excessive levels of dangerous chemicals, and fake toys may contain hazardous and prohibited chemicals. So these counterfeit medicines that we talked about may compose of dangerous and contaminated substances, and sometimes they even contain these dangerous active ingredients. There's a significant potential for dangerous ingredients or parts and counterfeits and resulting in adverse events constituting serious health and safety risk. Counterfeiting also has detrimental effects on industries as well as economies. The direct impact of counterfeiting is a loss of revenue, which is estimated at billions of dollars for any given industry. However, the indirect effects enhance the negative impact beyond the scope of these industries and economy. They've resulted in decreased innovation, loss of trade revenues, higher rates of unemployment, and overall slower economic growth. The continuous growth of global counterfeiting of the global counterfeiting industry is a major concern. Fueled by the proliferation of the internet use and social media platforms, the magnitude of global physical counterfeiting is estimated to have significantly increased since the beginning of the century. No legitimate business or country is immune to the impact of counterfeiting, and no single actor can successfully battle it alone. A critical element in the fight against counterfeiting and piracy is increased awareness of what IP is and why it's such a valuable part of the global economy. And that's why we're here today. Far too many governments <clears throat> look the other way when it comes to the theft of IP. The lure of market access should be used as an incentive to convince trading partners that they too should increase their protection of IP rights. But let's look at the numbers and the real impact of counterfeiting. In April 2016, the OECD released a new report that puts the value of imported fake goods worldwide at four, $461 billion, compared with the other total imports of world trade at $17.9 trillion. That's more than double prior estimates in 2005 when they released a similar report, 
and more than double of the, of the 2014 profits of the top 10 companies in the world combined. Up to 5% of goods imported in the EU are fakes. 5%. Most originate in the middle income or emerging countries. According to the World Customs Organization, the international sales of counterfeit goods represent between 5 to 7% of total world trade. China alone is estimated to be the source for more than 86% of counterfeits, which I think we find true. You know, when, we, when we're online searching for products and we look at them, we, we oftentimes think that they come from China, and it's been confirmed, 86% of them. So this translates into $396.5 billion worth of counterfeit goods each year and equates to 1.5 of China's GDP and 12% of its exports. Customs authorities are only seizing extremely small fractions of the value of the total estimated, as, uh, estimated counterfeits, as little as 2.5%. Globally, it's estimated that counterfeiting has resulted in the loss of 2.5 million jobs and more than 60 billion euros in tax revenue losses among the G20 economies. So in conclusion, I, I think that we know that almost everyone in society is a user and a potential creator of intellectual property. Its protection is necessary to provide incentives and financing for innovation and creation, which in turn lead, lead to economic, cultural, and social progress. The large economic and social impact of IP theft should be a priority for society not just its rights holders. And unless governments, businesses, citizens, and groups like us make a coordinated effort to uphold the IP system, society will not reap the benefits it creates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm sure that uh, once we publish our next IP letter, we should take a side note on just only the figures that you presented, just to make people aware um, how big the issue really is, because it's not just handbags, car parts, music, tobacco, etc. It's much more. Great. The next gentleman, gentleman to my right, uh, is uh, Jared Parks. Uh, many of you have uh, met him already. Jared is now the executive director of Advocacy and External Affairs of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, actually for the Global Intellectual Property Rights Center, the GIPC, who everybody of us who is working in this field, of course, knows. Um, uh, Jared has been uh, working on the Hill for many years, and he's now kind of the middleman between the Hill and the think tanks, um, whether it's uh, international, but also on a local and or local, you must not say local in the U.S., but in the, on a U.S. level. Uh, Jared, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Barbara. And, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see a lot of you again. And to those of you who haven't met yet, looking forward to spending some time with you uh, today and tomorrow, and um, perhaps on the Free Market Roadshow for those of you who will join. Um, Barbara, thank you um, for you and, um, and your team at the Austrian Economic Center for all you do to put on this conference. I mean, it's just a tremendous feat um, that you pull off and so valuable to all of us. Um, and before I start, I want to uh, begin with a point of unanimous agreement. I think all four of us on this panel, and probably Barbara too, very glad to be here in sunny Prague instead of uh, gloomy Washington, D.C. today. Um, so good to be here. Um, so I'm uh, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as Barbara mentioned. As uh, many of you know, um, it's the world's largest uh, business association. So we represent uh, more than three million businesses of all shapes and sizes across all industry sectors, um, both uh, domestically for us in the U.S. Um, and around the world, um, many, many companies um, in the EU. Um, within the chamber, I'm in the, the Global Innovation Policy Center, as Barbara mentioned, and our fundamental mission um, is to promote the importance of intellectual property rights um, to businesses and jobs um, and consumers um, in the U.S. Um, and around the world. Uh, Andrew touched on it, but when I think about IP, I sort of think of it in, in two different buckets. First of all, don't think about lawyers. Um, there's sort of the human bucket and, and the economic bucket. You know, it's, uh, it's about, you know, think of your favorite movie, your favorite song, your favorite book, um, you know, life-saving medicines that improve people's lives and save lives. Think of your iPhone. I hate mine at the moment, but all of these things are fundamentally um, driven by um, IP driven innovation and creativity. Um, it's also about jobs and growth, um, as Andrew touched on. Um, in the US, intellectual property supports more than 45 uh, million jobs, um, according to our um, US Department of Commerce. It's, res it's responsible for 40% of our GDP, 
about three quarters of our exports. Um, here in Europe, um, there are some updated numbers that I just saw um, from uh, the European Patent Office that estimates that IP um, drives about 40% of all economic out output um, in Europe annually and employs about 82 million um, Europeans, which is about 40% of, uh, of Europe's workforce. So hard to, overestimate, to overstate um, its importance, um, both to jobs and growth and competitiveness, but also to, to saving um, and, and improving lives um, for all. Um, one thing I wanted to share with you briefly today um, is the Global IP Center's International IP Index, um, which is one of the biggest tools uh, that we have to help demonstrate the importance um, of intellectual property around the world. Um, we first created the index in uh, 2012. Uh, we noticed that there uh, were academic tools and indices that evaluated certain components of IP rights, but really nothing that pulled all the pieces together. Um, so we wanted to create a rigorous academic tool, please. Oh, there we go. Um, a rigorous academic tool that assessed the overall framework in place in key markets around the world, and thus the International IP Index was born. Um, so it really is a comparative tool that illustrates the strengths and weaknesses of each country relative to their neighbors and competitiveness, uh, competitors. Um, and it's intended to provide an objective metric um, to create a snapshot of countries' IP frameworks in order to celebrate the areas in which they excel and also identify uh, some of the gaps um, where they can improve. Let's see, slide here. <clears throat> Um, so we began back in 2012 by examining the IP framework in 11 countries. Um, the index is now in its sixth edition, uh, and the 2018 index, which um, I have to distribute um, after our presentation, um, now assesses 50 economies representing about 90% of global GDP. Um, it benchmarks the laws and practices in these countries against 40 indicators in eight broad categories, um, each indicator is worth one point for a maximum score of 40. Um, and we created these indicators in collaboration um, with our members and with industry at large um, to identify those that they believe are uh, indica in indicative of a robust um, IP system. Um, I'll tell you off the bat, one of the criticisms we get every year is that um, the index uh, is biased. Um, and to that, um, we say, of course it is. We're operating um, with the basic premise that intellectual property is good and is a, a fundamental property right um, that should be protected. So, um, yes, guilty as charged. Um, you know, if you look at things like um, the Global Corru Corruption Index, uh, that operates under the assumption that corruption is bad. So indices have, tend to have in uh, inherent uh, biases. So um, our bias is that we think intellectual property is a fundamental property right that's a good thing. Um, let's see. Um, these are some of the, uh, the broad indicator, indicator categories, just eight um, of the 40 that are included in the report. Um, but just uh, by way of example, in the patent space, um, what we do there is uh, we measure sort of the basic term of patent protection against um, the standard, uh, which is included in the TRIPS agreement, which for those of you who don't know, is the trade-related aspects of intellectual property agreement. Um, among WTO members, which was established in 1994. Um, and this indicator, 49 out of 50 countries included in the index were, uh, received a full point. Um, then we examine the, sco the scope of the right, whether it applies broadly to many forms of IP-intensive technologies. Um, next, we look at measures which create legal certainty. This includes mechanisms to ensure that innovators and creators will actually be able to utilize their rights in practice. So we look at things like patent enforcement mechanisms or judicial processes um, in place to defend the patent right. Um, so that's one example in the patent space there. So what's new in the index uh, this year, since we're in the sixth edition? Um, first of all, we've added five new countries and six new indicators. Um, over the six years of the report, we wanted to continue to refine the methodology to make sure it's capturing what's important to IP-intensive industries. Um, through our regional rollouts around the world, we've also collected a lot of great feedback on how to make the index a more useful tool, and uh, we welcome that um, from anyone here today. Um, but because of that feedback, we wanted to make sure that the index took into account some of the ground-level IP-related initiatives that countries are undertaking to build a foundation for a stronger IP framework down the line. Um, so this year, uh, we added um, a systemic efficiency indicator 
which examines things like IP rights coordination, consultation with stakeholders, and IP awareness initiatives. So what are the overall scores? Um, the results, uh, some of them are as you would expect with the US, uh, the UK, and the EU economies uh, leading the way. Um, but what's interesting is that when we first started the index back in 2012, um, the US was the clear leader on IP. Um, now those top five economies are all within about one point or so of each other. Um, so we believe and hope that there's a new global race to the top on IP protection with this pack of countries um, leading the way. Some of the countries that you'd expect are further to the left, like Venezuela, Algeria, Egypt, um, and have the most room for growth. Um, so if you're one of the countries toward the bottom of the overall rankings chart, um, the index is not intended to be a name and shame uh, document to tell you what you're doing wrong, um, but uh, a tool to use um, to better understand um, how to improve your IP environment to attract things like foreign direct investment um, and, and benefit the, the citizens of that country. Um, as, as representatives of the business community, uh, we know that only so much investment uh, from business is available to go around. Um, in order for countries to attract that investment, there must be a strong legal and regulatory framework in place to provide companies with assurances their products will be protected. Um, IP is a key mechanism in that legal certainty in companies, and we ultimately see that the countries that invest in IP are more likely to attract that investment and become more economically and globally competitive. So why does this all matter? While the index is a tool to benchmark countries' IP environments, we also want to, to tell the story about why investing in IP matters. We believe it's in every country's best interest, both developed and developing alike, to create a robust IP framework because of the way it helps not only to attract foreign investment, but also because of the host of domestic benefits that effective IP systems provide. So for the last four years, the index has included a set of correlations which demonstrate the relationship between the strength of a country's IP framework and a number of socioeconomic goals. We sometimes see that countries view IP as a cost at the end of the innovation equation, but our data shows how if you invest in IP at the front end at inputs like R&D and venture capital, this, uh, this equals outputs which benefit the economy and stimulate competitiveness. Those outputs include factors such as the growth of the high-tech sectors, increased domestic innovative and creative activity, and a stronger overall business environment. Here's an example of two of the specific correlations we examine. On the input side, the index found that countries with more effective IP frameworks are 36% more likely to be a supportive environment for research and development. On the output side, the index found that countries with robust IP systems experience 70%, 75% more knowledge-based technological and creative outputs. So these are just two examples, but the key point is really that when countries make a conscious policy choice to invest in IP, the economic benefits to their people are real. Um, and each of these economic benefits are critical to the creation of 21st century knowledge-based economies. Um, so thank you for your time today. Um, looking forward to the discussion. I should have shown you that slide. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Jared. And uh, from a think tank's perspective, I can only add to that that uh, the index is very helpful if we talk to politicians, if we want to push them, and we can say, hey, listen, guys, country XYZ next door, especially in Europe, is much better than this because they do certain things. They respect rule of law and other things, and IP rights especially. So it's not only the letter that we can push them with, but it's also hard-based facts uh, that That's are right. a little bit more complex, but the index is a, a very, very helpful tool. And I invite all think tanks also to engage in those, in the, in the, in the construction or in the, in the collection of data. Absolutely. And again, I have um, abridged versions of it for all of you today, and the, and the entire index is like 200 pages long, but if you want it, I can send it to you or shoot you the link. And of course, another thing that, which we will add to the numbers uh, of the letter. Thanks. Thank Our next uh, speaker is Ross Marchand. He's the director of policy at TPA. He's a Mercatus George Mason um, 
how do you say alumni? Yes, alumni, and his and he has uh, interned for the Texas Policy Foundation, American Legislative Exchange Council, and many other uh, uh, groups uh, that are good friends of. Uh, the Rocho and, and of course of many European think tanks. Um, he does a lot of research and he's a excellent publisher or actually writer and does many, many blogs. He's uh, working with Wall Street Journal, Wired, Forbes, uh, just to name it, Denver Post, Washington Examiner, just to name a few. Ross, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, so at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, we're all about educating taxpayers and customers about some of the unintended consequences of government meddling, at national level, state and local level, predominantly in the U.S., but also around the world. And of all the issues that we deal with, whether it be tax or regulatory issues or property rights, one of the most misunderstood areas that we encounter concerns intellectual property. Just the general concept is poorly understood, but in addition, you have a lot of conservative and libertarian groups, and this was covered yesterday in yesterday's panel, who say, is this really necessary? Is intellectual property just an extension of government overreach? And what we found through our research and through our publications at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance is intellectual property is absolutely necessary. It's a fundamental bedrock in making sure the government is limited and serves the American people and taxpayers. And I think that what you see, especially over the past couple of years, is that when intellectual property arose and it goes by the wayside, you see a replacement of government and the government funds research and development. And research has borne out the fact that that simply does not work because surprise, surprise, the government is very bad at targeting investments and picking winners from losers. And I think that in order to illustrate that, it's necessary to go around the world and see what exactly is going on in terms of intellectual property protection. And the results, as illustrated before by the previous panelists, show that it is a very um, lopsided and really just filled with uneven developments over the past couple of years around the globe. And I want to start, of course, with the best country in the world, the United States. <laughs> it's not pretentious, it's true, and I think everyone agrees. I see heads nodding across the audience. <laughs> It's about competition. Yes, it's all about competition. That is true. But unfortunately, we are relinquishing our title as foremost uh, champion of economic liberty in the field of intellectual property since, I would say, around 2011. And what happened in 2011 is you had the passage of this legislation called the American Vents Act. And it replaced the traditional method of adjudication of property disputes um, with a appeals board um, at USPTO, that's the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And normally, if you had a case, you have to bring it before the court and, um, and disputes were decided as any sort of other property disputes were decided. But now you have an administrative hearing where it's much, much easier to contest claims of intellectual property. And I know administrative hearing, it sounds like something that could be potentially as robust as a court proceeding, but in fact, research from the Heritage Foundation bears out the fact that patent and trademark invalidation rates, cancellation rates, are much higher through these administrative hearings than in traditional court proceedings. And that is far from the only thing that's happened. Obviously, the legislative branch in the US is but one branch, not all power lies there. And you've seen also unfavorable developments in the Supreme Court. A few years ago, there was something that was commonly known as the Alice decision, and it held that if basically the ruling was complicated, but it disproportionately punished patents in the software and engineering sectors um, that disproportionately relied on mathematical formulas in their patents. And as a result, you have a lot of engineering firms and you have a lot of software companies saying, I'm not sure if the United States is the most favorable place for intellectual property protection anymore. Now, I don't want to be a pessimist, and I don't want to say this is all doom and gloom here, especially since the transfer of administrations in 2016, you have seen an improvement, and you have seen the appointment of officials that are committed to intellectual property protection. And in the court, courts on various levels have affirmed intellectual property and rolled back some of the erosion in the software and engineering areas. But overall, we have been sliding, and when companies are thinking about relocating to the United States or staying either in the United States or elsewhere, they are looking at these legislative decisions and they're looking at these court decisions. 
And I would say that in Europe, it's also uh, similarly disconcerting for advocates of intellectual property. And what you see in Europe, a lot more so than in the United States, is if you're trying to get a pharmaceutical approved, you're trying to get a product approved, um, you have a principle of risk aversion, and it takes a very, very long time to bring products to market. And there's a very real prospect that if you're trying to bring things to market, your intellectual property will not be protected during that time. What the European Union tried doing is they tried issuing these things called supplementary protection certificates, saying that as long as your product is under consideration by regulatory authorities, your product will be protected for a number of years. Unfortunately, there are indications that the European Union is going to grant the right of generics to supersede these certificates and get temporary waivers. So if you're a pharmaceutical and you're looking to develop life-saving medications in the European Union, maybe you're thinking twice because of the introduction of this waiver system. And also, in terms of court damages and settlement adjudication of these intellectual property claims, it's very important to have a system of punitive damages to make sure you have a legal deterrent um, to stop copycats in their tracks. And unfortunately, the EU has lagged behind the US in the case of punitive damages. Uh, Poland tried superseding that and tried introducing a more robust um, set of incentives to deter copycats, but the European Union is really only meeting them halfway and still lags far behind the United States in that field. So you see whether in the EU or in the US, these developed countries I don't want to misstate this. I think it's very important to keep in mind that developed countries are still the foremost champions of intellectual property, and I think that any intellectual property rights index will bear that out. But what you see, especially in Asia, in developing countries like China and Vietnam, is that intellectual property is going from zero to one very quickly. And you have governments like the Chinese government, and they're saying, well, if we just enforce intellectual property a little bit and we increase patent holding rates, then we could attract some developed country competition over to us. Now, China, just a few years ago, you would not be able to reliably enforce intellectual property in a court of law. That is increasingly changing. And the GIPC index, China is slowly but surely rising in the ratings. And the Chinese government has made a point of strengthening patent holding rates to try to send a message to the world, hey, we're in the patent and trademark protection business as well. So that's not to say that China is in danger of overtaking the US and the EU anytime soon, but it is disconcerting because if you're a company in the developed world and you're thinking about locating overseas due to lower labor costs, you're saying, well, maybe I don't wanna to go to a developing country like China because of things like intellectual property um, and other less than robust property protection measures. But I think that because China is increasing their intellectual property protection, um, maybe I will take a second look at relocating to China or to Vietnam. Now, what is at stake here exactly? Because I think it's very easy to lose sight of what is important when it comes to intellectual property. And the commonly cited most important industries for intellectual property is pharmaceutical development and software development. But as we go into new industries in the 21st century, there are other things that we're not even thinking about where intellectual property protection will be key. And whoever has the highest rankings, whoever has the most robust system of intellectual property will win out in the next great economic and industry race in the 21st century. Now I'm thinking specifically, for example, about space exploration. You have the International Space Station, which is owned by a variety of governments in the developed world, and you also have private space stations that are coming to the forefront. And scientists are thinking about sending over and trying to attract private talent to develop life-saving and game-changing technologies. And they're saying, is it going to be worth it? Because obviously it's a huge investment to launch scientists and private developers up into outer space, into these private space stations. And right now, there's not even a consistent assurance of intellectual property protection on either the International Space Station or in outer space in general. So the point of this is that intellectual property is a multifaceted issue and it spans a variety of industries. And we are in danger of underestimating how important it is going to be in the upcoming exploration and development wars um, uh, you know, of this upcoming century and in coming decades. So it is very important, and if we, um, if we let down our guard on intellectual property protection and we let economic development go to other countries, not only will we see 
less jobs and less opportunities in America and Europe, but also the government will step in and fill in the vacuum of private ingenuity and innovation, and you will see the rise of government subsidies that are poorly targeted and are going to cost taxpayers billions upon billions of dollars. So let's not let down our guard and let's keep up a robust system of intellectual property protection. Thank you. This actually also raises the question, and I'm playing devil's advocate here because we need to cover all kinds of, of, of uh, angles. What about subsidies to Tesla? Mm -hmm. And just keep it, and then let's discuss it maybe. Yeah. The next gentleman uh, that I have the privilege to introduce, and I just opened my notebook to make sure I introduce him properly, because I've known Richard Dr. Rahn only for more than... Um, about 20 years or so, and he keeps complaining, you know, you don't, uh, you don't introduce me properly as I did earlier today. Uh, you know, if I, if I start the long record, uh, you know, of all his advantages he has and of all his uh, good deeds he did, not only for the, Europe, for the think tank movement across the world, and especially supporting young groups and young, young thinkers who founded their institutes. Richard was the one who was always there with advice and with help and linking us to the right people. So this is one advantage. The second, of course, is, and now I may quote Dan Mitchell, if I may, and a couple of others, the one best-eyed economist. And uh, since we know each other, I may, I'm allowed to say that. Thank you, Richard. Um, Richard is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He's, uh, well, among many other institutes, he's been in politics, he's working with the White House, with, with the Bush administration, I think one, uh, at least one Bush, and then Reagan is the most famous, uh, where we have learned a lot from what Richard has uh, uh, told us, has taught us. Uh, he's a journalist as well, and of course he's also... He was sitting on the, as the first non-Cayman member of the board of directors of the Cayman Island Monetary Authority. So Richard, Richard Spectrum, having been uh, the chief economist of the Chamber of Commerce a couple of years before you were there probably, uh, is very wide. Um, and having said that, um, I will give the floor to you. Don't be surprised. We never know what Richard starts with. I am chairman of Improbable Success Productions, where we're showing success stories of countries around the world in, in film. Um, she did get the chamber title correct. I was vice president chief economist again before Jared was born here. <laughs> correct. A few rungs higher than me. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I remember when we got the original rant, uh, land grant for the building, which is right across from the White House. <laughs> Actually, um, years ago when I was uh, at the chamber, the, we did a tax reform bill under President Reagan. And in it, it had a special provisions for uh, historic areas. And it was a there's this huge subsidy in the bill where if you had an historic property, <clears throat> um, you could get these uh, tax credits for renovation, and it worked out to more than 100% of the value. <clears throat> well, uh, a couple of my colleagues in our tax department, David Burton, that many of you people know, and uh, said to me, you know, we should take the chamber building, which had been right on Lafayette Square, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Cole knows it well, uh, and uh, it's, it's a great location directly across from the White House. Uh, I had this wonderful <coughs> office at the top corner of the building looking down at the White House, <clears throat> and they came in and said, well, let's sell the building and let's lease it back for 99 years. we get the big sum of money and we could renovate the building and do a lot of other good things. <clears throat> so I, I thought this was a wonderful idea. And at that point, we had a fellow named Bill Van Meter, who was uh, like the executive vice president for administration, taking care of all the mechanics of the buildings and personnel and stuff. <clears throat> nice guy. So I went down and presented this to Bill. Bill had been there forever. 
And on his wall, he had a big photo of the people who had raised the original money to build the chamber building. This classic building. And I went and presented and he looked at this, shaking his head. And he says, Richard, look at those people up there on that picture. What would they think if we sold the building they worked so hard to raise the money to build? And I said, well, we're, you know, we're an economic organization. This would be rational to do, but they had nothing to do with it at all. <clears throat> but that gets back to the U.S. Constitution, so we're talking about my origins here in, in Washington. <laughs> the, the U.S. Constitution was the first constitution, as far as I know, that actually talked about intellectual property rights and property rights in the Constitution. We have a provision in there for the establishment of the Patent Office. They talked about useful innovations at that time. <coughs> so this goes way back. And for those of you who are like history at all, it's interesting to read the debate in our Constitution at the time about what they should put in under property rights protection, and particularly intellectual property. And these ideas go back several centuries. Um, the, there was a big debate of how many years for the first, for the patent. Many years, 14, for a couple of centuries, 14 years. They established the 14 year because apprenticeships at that time were traditionally seven years. And in fact, there was a lot of indentured servants that came over from Europe at that point, from uh, England and Germany and Czech Republic and others. Czech Republic didn't exist, but people from the area, they would come in, serve as indentured servants for seven years before they could have full freedom in the U.S. And there was this big debate whether there ought to be you know, one indentured servant period or, or, or uh, <coughs> or two, or three, and they, they compromised on two, the 14-year period, which is all highly irrelevant to what we're talking about today, but uh, I like historical tidbits. Now, we have these various indices, and I wish I had had Jared's beforehand, because I will do a column on his. I had the ones from the uh, Alliance for Property, the Property Rights Alliance, and I've got an article coming out on a normal weekly newspaper column Tuesday morning. And in that one, they rank the top five in terms of property rights. Uh, New Zealand, Finland, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, Norway. The U.S. they have listed as 14. The U.S. is not the top of hardly any of these indices anymore, as much as I'd like to see it. You know, the various indices of economic freedom and other things we used to be at the top. Uh, we've been drifting down, and uh, people like Scott Hodge here of Tax Foundation, of course, Dan Mitchell, and many of the rest of you have been Americans fighting to reverse that. Uh, the Czech Republic comes in at about number 30. This is out of 127 countries they measured. 30 isn't bad, not great. Poland is 41. Um, at the bottom, You've got Venezuela and Yemen. You might expect at 126 and 127. Um, China is our big topic of conversations these days, and it's number 52. It's been getting better, but there's still lots of problems. And they have been mentioned. I won't repeat what my colleagues uh, have laid out here today, all of which I agreed with. But with China and a number of these other countries, a lot of it, is a problem by U.S. businesses who misprice their technology and misprice their intellectual property. And you have a lot of them say, well, we go to China. Chinese say that we have to transfer part of our intellectual property if we're going to open a factory. Well, it's up to the company whether or not they actually want to move to China and whether they want to abide by the Chinese agreement but there's a price they should charge the Chinese. They've got an innovation, and you've got to assume, given the history, the Chinese are basically going to steal it from you. So you say, what is the price of this particular innovation? How much is it worth? 
And when you're, you're deciding not to go to China, not just looking at the cost of building the building and labor costs, you have to look at the price of that, of pricing that particular technology <coughs> that you may well lose exclusive right to. Now remember, intellectual property, much of technology, <coughs> is somewhat different than physical property. Uh, if um, <coughs> if uh, Barbara sells her house, she no longer has the use of her house. If you sell, uh, particularly if you license intellectual property, which is often you still have use of it, um, but you're giving up the monopoly right. So when operating in a place like China, um, businesses need to be much more hard-headed and rational about coming in. Again, if you're going to have some kind of particularly tech business, and much of your value is in that technology, and the Chinese say to you, well, you've got to transfer this technology, you don't do that for nothing. And if you said, well, okay, we'll agree, <coughs> but you've got to price that technology and price it correctly. <coughs> If you don't know how to do that, there was a great book written in 1972 of how to do this. Uh, the author is Richard Ron, called uh, Pricing Decisions and Foreign Licensing, in case anybody would like to uh, do that. And, you know, once in a while, these things you did many years ago suddenly come in. Um, but it's, it, the problem is, uh, I'll talk more of those practical business points because you guys all talked on the policy. But businessmen tend to be terrible in figuring out how to price technology. Most companies, patent departments, are staffed by engineers who have law degrees. And that doesn't they're not trained to think in kinds of economic terms as economists. And um, so they tend to use precedents. Years ago, when I actually, back when I did that book, um, which I made money on, I sold it to patent law firms at a high price at the time. But the, um, they use precedents a lot. And, I remember in aerospace, the precedent was 7.5%. Automotive was 5%. Paper box and board was 1.5%. Often it had nothing to do with the intrinsic value of, of the technology. And my little contribution to knowledge back then was I would basically built a decision theory model of how you make decisions step by step all the way through to come up with better pricing. And actually some companies actually adopted it. Models. Um, but most things, actually, in public policy can often be solved by correctly pricing things. And people don't think about the utility of the price system with all kinds of uh, public policy issues. And I expect your center at the chamber is probably doing a lot of that kind of work in getting people to think about that. Um, but that is, it's a uh, the key consideration, and so when I hear a business guy say, ah, you know, the Chinese or whoever saying I got to transfer the technology, I'll say to them, well, how much are you charging for it? And there is a price. Some people have very low prices for things they provide, like Dan Mitchell, and other people have high prices, like Barbara. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, with that, I'll leave it for questions. <laughs> <laughs> to be determined what Dan's services are. <laughs> <laughs> They're all <a> disappointment. <laughs> okay, um, gentlemen, would any of you prefer to uh, refer to anybody else on the panel before we open it to the Yes. Story? Uh, I, I wanted to mention um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's index, and I was hoping that Jared maybe could recall the story um, about how sometimes some of the governments use this index. Um, they had been publishing it, the chamber had been publishing it for I think four years when we got a call from India and they were responding to a compulsory patent 
and they were wondering what they could do to tweak their rating a little bit. And they didn't know. We, I actually went over to India and met with some of the officials there, and <clears throat> the chamber in its typical fashion came in and kind of like stomped its fist and said, you know, we are the chamber, hear us roar. And they said, we're not doing anything. It was a really hot day, actually. And, um, and he looked at me, and I, and I said, you know, we're happy to be here. And he asked me if I'd like some hot tea. And I get a little hot anyways. I'm sweating. And I say, yeah, I said, oh, I'd, love some, I'd love some hot tea. And so he said, oh, okay, like, we'll get some hot tea for you. And so that was the connection that we started to talk about IP with um, their, what their equivalent Department of Commerce is. And they were able just to make some small tweaks within, um, w within their, their formula of the, and Jared may remember better, but uh, of the, f the formula the chamber was using to increase their, um, their level just a little bit. And governments are concerned. There was another example where China was bringing a delegation. Yeah. yeah um, so that, uh, India still has some big problems on IP, let's be clear about that. But, uh, uh, but yes, the, I do recall that. Um, the, but the point overall is that governments we see are starting to use the index and utilize it as a real tool um, to understand you know, ways that they can actually improve. Um, um, the story I think you're referring to is when we first started doing the index, <clears throat> the, the Chinese just flipped out. They, they heard about it and they were going to get slammed in it, of course. Um, and they, um, they threatened to cancel the visit of the vice premier, I think it was, to Washington, which was two days later. Um, if, if we released it. Um, so we had this big internal debate and said, well, screw it, let's do it anyway. Um, so because we were, nobody could pronounce uh, his name and nobody knew who he was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the premier, the vice premier ended up coming anyway, um, but they, they started off being furious and now um, we've seen a total, you know, a, not a reversal, but certainly a different approach from the Chinese since then. Every year they come to us and sort of ask how we see them placing this year and what they can do and things like that. So it's really opened um, a rather constructive dialogue over the years. Yeah, you know, and a broader point here about all these indices and our various issues, they are highly useful in the of, of getting countries change. Cross and wake up. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. <laughs> Back, Cross has done amazing and in terms of the various indices of economic freedom, um, I might just spend a, a sentence or two of how those indices have caused policies to be better. Area. Take the mic. So uh, this was not because of good life, you know. So. Uh, Bulgaria reintroduced central planning in the middle of the 90s. And since then, you know, it has been the poorest country in, in, in the European Union. What we did was just fix equality before the tax law at a 10%. Uh, why 10%? 10, of course, is a very good figure. But when we calculated, uh, when we calculated the actual compliance, it was a 12%. So it was natural to put it at 10%. And the second thing we did, which is related to <clears throat> after the topic of this panel, uh, we calculated the compliance costs uh, uh, in order to operate under the licensing and all these things, you know. And it happened that uh, it's twice cheaper to operate without licensing and without all these, whatever. There were 878 licensing regimes leftovers, you know, from the communist times. So in about six months, we reduced them to 39. So, and then the compliance costs, you know, become very, 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 very reasonable. So then with entering the European Union, the compliance costs had risen again, you know, and now we have to deal with the European Union. Uh, at the same time, with intellectual property rights, it's not very good in Bulgaria especially in the mining industry, the things we discussed the first day. Um, it is basically okay if uh, and when uh, the, 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 the concession agreements are managed by the international law or some other country law in this particular respect, you know, the intellectual property rights. Uh, 
And we had uh, great successes, for example, uh, the cleanest and most efficient non-ferrous metals refineries are in Bulgaria. They were the worst globally. When they were privatized, they were operating under the international law, and now they are one of the best. They are not owned by Bulgarians, but it doesn't matter. So, but we had a failure here. Uh, Chevron receives first European uh, concession contracts for uh, shale gas exploration in Bulgaria. Uh, after an effective campaign by Gazprom, the parliament, without any hearing, in, in, a, in, a week of, uh, in a week of sort of called debate, they banned the fracking technology at all. So uh, Chevron lost the, the signature payment for the contract, and they left. Quick so question. They lost quick, 60 million. Quick question. What if uh, not only um, the Institute of Market Economics and others had, what if the Institute of Market Economics and others had stood up in joint, as joint forces, being able to react very fast as think tanks? Would there be, would there have been a chance to turn the public opinion or the uh, or where the politicians simply bri well bribed or uh, whatever to change their opinion? Uh, hmm. uh, so when we realize, you know, that uh, the country is not doing very much okay with uh, the intellectual property rights in particular, uh, then we become co-founders of the International Property Rights Index. Uh, we tried all these uh, whatever uh, um, uh, efforts to do the transparency thing, you know, in the budget side. Uh, Ex-colleagues of mine, they are, uh, uh, they, they, they are members of the, of the team which calculates the open budget index and that sort of stuff. But with, uh, uh, with Chevron, we, we, we failed completely. We knew all the cost benefits, you know, of, of, of the exploration and possible production if there, is a, there was a commercial vi viability, but it was not possible, you know, to to change anything. But the broader point here is this group, in this room, our organizations produce a lot of different indices. Countries do compete with each other. They increasingly pay attention to the kinds of indices various groups produce as the measures themselves. Just that single activity that most of us here have been involved in point or another, has had a very constructive influence world and uh, sometimes we ought to try to quantify that that, oh, that that's how that's georgia world. that's how georgia become one oh, of yeah. the freest countries in the world mm -hmm. so the, the the government and bendu kids a group you know they were basically motivated you know to put the country back on the map and yeah. be the first and they're almost the first so feel good about the work you've done because a lot, of, a lot broader and far well, thanks for patting our shoulders, Richard. Um, and Benedict Barber. <laughs> Andrew. I, I had another point, or kind of question. Yesterday, there was some debate about patents and what innovation um, you know, should be protected because it should benefit the most amount of people. Uh, and I, I don't have an answer for this. This is more of a question. But when we think about patents, people automatically think about it's a protection. And I don't always see it. it yes, it is a protection. But it's also a determined release of that protection with the government to benefit society at large. So without patents, you could potentially just have a trade secret, and that innovation would never be released and always be sold at a certain level and not released for a generic. So, uh, Jared and, and, and Richard. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, one of the most frequent criticisms of, of IP on, in principle, as I'm Phil back there knows, um, is that uh, in, in the instance of medicines that it inhibits access to medicines um, and you know really nothing could be further from the truth um, the very existence of every generic medicine in the world is predicated upon the prior existence of innovative medicine that somebody uh, took tremendous risk um, and, and made tremendous amounts of investment in R&D to create I think Bill if you know the stats shout them out but I think it's like 10 years and $4 billion in 
you know, one in 400 um, of these efforts actually makes it to market after the regulatory process and things like that. Um, and, and often studies like the Hudson Institute did a study actually that found that some of the the largest factors in increasing the cost of medicines is actually not intellectual property. It's bad domestic policy in foreign markets like um, high tariffs and taxes on importing drugs and things like that. Um, and you really see that argument kind of hijacked by or used by um, countries that are bad actors in this space. Like India, you mentioned that. Um, you know, there was a, um, an innovative cancer medication called Glivic. I think I'm saying that right. Glivic? Glivic? Um, a few years ago that India um, compulsory licensed um, under the, the premise that Indians couldn't afford it. Well, first of all, the, the, the company that, the innovator company that made it was providing it at low cost um, to those, to the Indians who needed it. And second of all, the Indian government had no intention of, of compulsory licensing it to, to actually help their people. They wanted to produce it domestically in generic form and, and export it. Um, so I think the point you raise is a very good one. But, uh, yeah, the, Richard, and the, then yeah. Ralph. We have a wonderful empirical example of the importance of patents, and that is the old Soviet Union. <clears throat> Some of you probably don't remember it because you're not <laughs> old enough, but I do. I was an advisor to the Russian government when they first early days of the transition, back in 92 and 93, primarily talking about taxes and other matters. And one day, the fellow who would be like the head of the patent office gave me a call, and he said, Professor Ron, uh, I'd like to talk to you. And he, I said, sure. He said, we have 1.4 million secret patents. <laughs> they call them author certificates. And we would like it to market it to the West. Could you help us? And I, of course, said yes, having no idea what I was going to do. But <laughs> the key thing was... The Soviets had spent huge quantities of money on science and engineering. You know, that was their whole thing, STEM. Nothing came out of this. I mean, they, the huge portion of their GDP was poured into this, and the practical results were nil. They had some military innovation, but there was nothing in the civilian area. In fact, we had set up a company, and I was chairman for a while, where we brought Russian technology out of Russia but there just wasn't much there. Uh, they were ahead a little bit in things like crystal growth and metallurgy, but the rest of the world, uh, rest of the things, they were way, way behind. And it's because they had no mechanism. And in these author certificates, it'd be, let's say, like, uh, Scott comes up with something, and they could have four co-authors of any author certificate, and each would get 50 rubles. So you always want to make sure you got your 200 rubles, so Scott would say with three of his buddies, why don't you sign on this, split the rubles. And so you found all, all these certificates had four authors. But then once you had this, there was nothing you could do with it, no matter how brilliant the innovation might have been. And if you can't protect it and market it, develop and market it, it all becomes useless and nothing happens. And we just have that example. So the next time somebody says to you, well, the state ought to have this or we ought to give it away, <coughs> Well, we had that example. It was called the Soviet Union. What did we get? <laughs> uh, Ross. Um, if you're talking about the idea of trade secrets um, as a potential, as I guess something that would sort of become more widespread in the absence of comprehensive intellectual property guarantees by governments, it's interesting to think and ask whether or not science is a public good. And there's this famous British uh, biochemist and economist by the name of Terence Keeley. And he said, no, because for a lot of scientific research and endeavors, copying costs are so large and approach 100% that even if you can, in theory, copy a drug and there was no law against it, it would be so hard to do and it would be so costly that no one would rationally do that in the private market anyway. And there are a number of problems with that analysis, but even if you buy the fact or the argument that copying costs are close to 100% of a product, you cannot deny that in this new economy, the things that are being invented, the things that are being produced, have smaller and smaller copying costs. And what you see with things like software and with things like newer drugs 
is the copying costs are low enough and the companies are concerned enough that if someone stops working for a company, they'll jump ship and then go to a rival company and then they'll just copy it. And that is a real possibility in the absence of robust intellectual property. And what does that do? I think that creates an incentive for companies to create these really restrictive non-compete clauses and have all these stipulations upon hiring individuals. <laughs> and everyone is starting to take notice of this and everyone is saying, oh, companies can't do this, they shouldn't be allowed to do this. Well, guess what? If you have strong enough intellectual property protections, companies will not have, well, the incentive won't be totally taken away, but they won't have nearly as much of an incentive to do those complex policies to begin with. Octavia. Um, I'm not necessarily familiar with uh, this uh, IP in industry. I, I've um, made uh, yesterday a confession. I have mixed feelings. I, I'm not necessarily against, uh, it's by far, uh, uh, such an attitude. But uh, I want to ask, when, uh, when speaking about uh, IP protection, do you have in mind only public protection of uh, I, uh, intellectual property uh, by uh, uh, regular law? Or uh, we can add to this picture uh, something like private protection of intellectual property from uh, organizations such as uh, those uh, 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 harnessing uh, customer awareness, uh, those who indicate uh, the fakes and frauds uh, and uh, separate them from genuine creators. I, I think it's, it's a, a nicer and smoother mechanism to honor uh, the, the true creation and the true in, in, innovation in markets, um, apart from the law, which has its, 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 its power and, and needs to be uh, strengthened. Um, these uh, reports cover such uh, um, uh, entities or, or, or behaviors. I, I'm, I'm not aware. This is just a, a, a curiosity. I have a quick answer to that, but gentlemen. Well, I of course, most intellectual property, the protection is in the people who have it in their head. And companies, of course, um, prohibit their employees from going off to a competitor because they've got this stock of knowledge. And one of the companies I was involved in, we brought a group of Russians over to make a pure silicon carbide. <laughs> Um, we were making a pure silicon carbide wafer, but the the Russians who had this knowledge, it was all in their heads. And they didn't write it down. They were this would be politically incorrect, but they were very undramatic in their approach in terms of having things done precisely. They all they were very smart, but they're all carrying it around in their head, which is not the way we really operated in the U.S. But that was the protection. Um, and in, in companies, um, it is the what employees know, not that you can put into a formal patent. And companies go to great lengths to make sure that if somebody knows something, they can't run off and give it to the competitor right away. And we do have legal provisions for doing that. Amen. Sure. Um, I think the question, if I understand, was regarding the private enforcement of, of IP. And um, in my time at the chamber, <clears throat> I came to learn a, um, a little bit about some of the company's efforts. They have their own enforcement coordinators, and a lot of times they do the research and supply the information um, to Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. Uh, there also is an intellectual property enforcement coordinator in the White House. So private industry is certainly doing their part to protect their own interest and their own assets, which alleviates a lot of the burden from the government to be doing that type of research specifically. You know, what I found interesting that um, it came to my surprise, um, certain tobacco companies were being overlooked because the government didn't see that as an important good. So um, you know, they weren't always getting the same amount of attention as um, you know, counterfeit purses or something. And it, the container um, issue is another thing of concern because they don't care whether it's a shipping container or a small box. That's just considered one container. So um, 
There is, there's a lot of examples where private industry is doing their own research and putting their own assets behind the enforcement of these efforts. Yeah, Andrew, actually, um, one of the efforts that came to, comes to mind for me was um, um, in the online space called the Copyright Alert System, um, in which um, copyright holders online banded together uh, to create a system that would alert um, consumers online who were uh, accessing pirated material. And there was sort of a graduated system of alerts to make sure they knew what they were doing. And then if they continued to do it, it ended up, um, I believe, throttling their internet speed if they um, repeatedly were, were bad actors. So there have been some of these um, private sector efforts. Um, but I actually, I wanted just to give a, a brief plug to, to copyright. And um, we spent a lot of time on patents today. Um, copyright is equally as important for many reasons, particularly for the, the creative community. Um, you know, the entire music and movie industry would not be viable without copyright protection. And I mean, when you think of you know the movies that are out today, um, you know, I remember growing up, um, the big you know hot movie for animation and special effects was Jurassic Park. And I mean, if you watched it today, it would, you know, it would be a joke. Um, and you know, all of that is is innovation. It's it's creativity, all to, all protected by um, by copyright. Um, and I think you know, piracy is just rampant online. Like this movie, um, Black Panther, um, came out a few weeks ago. Um, if you go on Google and type in "watch black," that's all you need to do. Watch black. The rest, the autofill is "watch Black Panther for free online." which directs you as the number one search result in autofill to a pirated site. Um, so it's a, you know, a massive problem. Okay. Related to that will be whole cryptocurrencies. This is happening. People are both trying to protect what they have. I've got that application for aluminum back currency, which of course any of you will think, well, that's mad having aluminum. But that's a long discussion. But the notion of trying to protect all these innovations that are being developed, and particularly since everything is encrypted, um, it is very hard for governments to come in and protecting national currencies. Now, those of us who have strong libertarian bents actually like the idea of breaking up the uh, central bank monopoly on currencies. And people like uh, Jerry Jordan, a well-known U.S. monetary economist who'd been a senior Federal, federal uh, Reserve official and one of Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors, Jerry's convinced, and I agree with him, that the day of national currencies, their monopolies, is basically open, over. But start to think of the consequences of all that as the future Bitcoins, there's a lot of problems with Bitcoin, the way it's done, but there will be these innovations coming along which will, be, uh, will solve many of those problems. And what is the world going to look like when you can, you mentioned your pirated copy, but you can transfer funds and in an untraceable way for all this pirated stuff and even the money... Uh, doesn't exist in the kind of form that um, we thought about. And since I'm plugging my books, in 1989, I wrote a, 88, 98, I wrote a book called The End of Money, which forecast all this stuff. So you can buy it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> before, I, before I give the, the word to Ross, uh, in earlier times, uh, we had those land registries and, and patent registries, paper, boring complicated, sending it around. Now with modern technology and especially blockchain technology, I think those registries uh, will help to get rid of or at least to make piracy more aware or uh, open and people who think and act uh, responsibly would probably not fall into the trap. So it's, it's something that we as well need to push and educate for us. Sure. I mean, with the pirating of movies, that is a growing problem. And I believe the most recent year I looked at was 2016, and you had the top four grossing movies being illegally downloaded over 200 million times. And it's also an issue of international cooperation, because a lot of the pirating originates in European countries, and then a lot of the customers live in the United States. 
But another thing that's really disconcerting about it is you would think of about a movie theater as an ideal place where you can, as a private industry, safeguard your product um, against predation and against privacy. And that's why everyone is familiar with some of these movie theater guidelines where they try to prevent you from having a camera um, on your hat or you know, covertly uh, filming via cell phone. But it's really just the effectiveness. There is some effectiveness, but it's not complete. And clearly, they're not able to prevent it. So if in that corner case, the movie theater is not able to prevent it, then there are a lot of other industries where, for example, software products are very full of, uh, of pirated. We need to make sure that we have robust measures in place to safeguard against that privacy, against that um, piracy. I think one of the big problems with piracy online is that it's it's so easy and it's something that's intangible. You know, the same person that would, or a lot of them are students and kids that go and download a song or a movie for free and think nothing of that is probably not the same person that would have gone into a record store and stolen the physical CD and walked out. Um, so I think there's sort of a, a perception challenge there. In other words, educate people, make them yeah. aware about <clears throat> property rights. Yeah. And just because something's easy, I think we'd all agree, does not make it, it doesn't mean you should do it. Questions from the floor? No. Well, then may I ask one? What do you think that we as think tanks, as do tanks, as industry, as thinking industry can do to help industry protect their IP and support them uh, in their efforts? Well, I can start. Um, I think a lot of what you guys are, are doing is a huge step in the right direction. Um, you know, help us get the word out um, to your communities and to the people that you have uh, influence with on the importance of IP, on the problems of IP theft. Um, I want to make everyone aware, I think Barbara mentioned um, the IP letter that's going around that many of you have signed. Um, things like this are really critical and so helpful um, in this effort. So thank you all to everyone who's signed it. If you haven't, I hope you'll consider it. Um, but, Richard. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I think one of the main things is just acting in a very business-like way about it and pricing your IP uh, at a way which is going to mac maximize your profits in that the person on the other side, when they're deciding whether or not to steal it from you, if they think you're going to be very aggressive with lawyers and going after you, they're going to figure that in their cost. I mean, we have lots of examples of this type of... Um, it's like when individuals break contracts, what is the legal cost going to be for the other side? You have some companies that have been always very aggressive on this. Remember back when Frank Greenberg was running, uh, eight, no, not Frank, uh, Greenberg, uh, first name, uh, Hank, Hank, Hank Greenberg running in AIG. They had a policy of anybody ever cheated them, they would spend whatever it took to get the money back. Um, and once that reputation got out, people didn't cheat them. And it was, you'd say, well, why would they spend $10 million to collect a $50,000 debt? Well, it was to establish this principle. And once that became widely known, they didn't have people welching on $50,000 anymore. Yeah, the the U.S. Okay. tax yeah the t U.S. Tax Foundation uh, copyright copywrote Tax Freedom Day back in 1971. The actual idea goes back to 1948. Oh. So you all got money. We all you all owe us money for. Well, the, German, <laughs> uh, it's a well, what's your what's your price for your, <laughs> your license? No, I, I. This is one of those cases where putting something actually into the. Uh, the common good uh, is better than trying to extract some sort of copyright. Thing. You know the song "Happy Birthday" is copyrighted. Is that right? Yeah, and radio stations who play "Happy Birthday" are supposed to put a little, pay a little fee to whoever <laughs> owns the copyright for the song "Happy Birthday." Well, um, Scott, I think that's done. All you, right. Scott, um, you mentioned so, um, yeah. Tax Freedom Day. You know something coming up that um, should be on everyone's calendar if it's not already. 
is World IP Day, April 26th. So Did we're that? not yet. We're we're going to get that <laughs> inserted into the Past. printed day planners. <laughs> but um, as we think about the industries affected uh, by intellectual property, I think the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, cites uh, 81 different industries. Um, when we first started highlighting um, IP around World IP Day, uh, we went to the chamber powers that be and we said, hey, we're going to get some associations together that are impacted by IP and come up with an ad. And um, I think first year it was just 11, and then it was 25, and then it was 30. And I think last year Jared put together uh, 47, 47. Yeah. 47 of these 81 industries, 47 um, uh associations that represented those industries came together and they said IP is important to us. It's everything from um, the confectioners, the candy association, to the automotive industries, to the International Franchise Association. We actually had the CEO come and speak at the chamber and said, when you look at a franchise, it's all about intellectual property. That's why you go to McDonald's, because you know that burger is going to taste the same. And you see those golden arches. That's why you're gravitated towards that trademark. So all these different industries are impacted by IP. And, um, you know, Barbara asked, you know, what, what all of you can do. On uh, April 26th on World IP Day, uh, we'll be running a social media campaign around it. So help us get the word out if you want to um, use it as a hook for blogs, things like that. Um, that would be tremendously appreciated. Also, make sure you, you have copyrights for your own organization name. Yes. People sometimes forget <laughs> that. <clears throat> and there's other people who use these things. So you've got to be careful that you go through not only copyright it, but use it. Your stylized eagle for the U.S. Chamber? Yes. I was there when they were coming up with that and trying to find something designed that others hadn't had so they could go ahead and protect it. And these are sometimes, I mean, they take a little bit of legal research cost. Well, the, the free market roadshow has been protected yeah. a long time ago. The brand. Well, we didn't mention the international uh, a patent convention. There are international conventions. So you, uh, if you file with a like normally with a year for a patent uh, in other countries, you don't have to do it the same day. Like with my aluminum pack money, file a patent in the U.S. I have a year. I select other patent. People can't use it, but I think it's public. Russ. Sure. Uh, when it comes to the question of what think tanks and do tanks, I don't know, is that the new lingo, can do to make sure that we have, um, an, we. Uh, we, yeah, exactly, we all together can have a robust system of intellectual property protection, I think it's all about getting the word out. Because people look at a new movie and they say, oh, the graphics are really neat. And they look at a new software and they say, this solves a lot of my day to day problems. It is important to draw customers and to taxpayers the link between intellectual property protection and the bottom line and those cool graphics and that cool software and to make sure that taxpayers are well aware of the cost of letting our guard down in terms of intellectual property protection. And we all can do our part to make sure that people know about those really important links. Anything to add? Well then, Jared? Oh, well, is anyone here from Budapest by any chance? Uh, no, they left already. Oh, okay. There's an IP crime conference in June in Budapest. Well, we'll let them know. But the good thing for you is, at least for, uh, we do on the 26th of April, there will be the roadshow in Athens. We will work on that. Okay. There will be the roadshow in Blagiovgrad. We will work on that. And I, am, I have the privilege to, to be on a, a Uni United Nations conference oh. in Malaga. Wow. And I will, I will oh. mention the IP day there. <laughs> let me see whether they kick me <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, or... I don't think... Sounds like a boondog. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, will be, it will be very interesting. Um, anything else that we can do to help the industry to get IP protected? So you're happy with what we do? Oh, yeah, you guys are great. Guys, the applause goes to you. Yes. <clears throat>